It is 1747, and George de Bologna is a fugitive. We are on the archipelago of Guadeloupe, and on the night of December 17th, George was drunk. And he had a sword. He had fatally wounded a man after challenging him to a fencing duel to settle a barroom quarrel. If he's charged with homicide, he will be sentenced to death. But George holds favor in the court of King Louis XV. But King Louis XV is an ocean away. Before the charges came down, George fled Guadeloupe to go to Paris with his lover Ninon and their young son Joseph, already a budding musical prodigy, to appear before the king in hopes of escaping the gallows. Oh, and did I mention that Nanon was his slave? Hello, I'm Colin Healy, and this is Jin and the Tonic, a reckless unpacking of music history's weirdest stories. Today's Jin is Diplomé Dry. It's French, and has a little thing over the O that, like most things in French, as you'll soon find out, I cannot pronounce. Tastes good, though. And with all this gin in my mouth, how can I pronounce anything anyway? And today's tonic oh, is F. And F stands for George. You already made that joke in the Japan episode. No, I didn't. Or did I? You'll have to watch to find out. Joseph Bologna Chevalier de Saint George, or as his contemporaries would come to call him, and as we're going to call him for the sake of time, St. George. St. George was born in Guadeloupe, the illegitimate son of a plantation owner and an African slave in 1745. His father, George de Bologna de St. George, that's the drunken sword man from the intro and, yes, his name is George St. George, was a former gentleman in the court of King Louis XV and was sent to the Caribbean as part of, you know, colonialism. Despite the fact that he was escaping a murder charge and he was a slave owner, Joseph's father uh, could have been worse. Quote, it says much for his father that when he returned to France in 1759, he took with him not only his wife and daughter, but also his black mistress and her child. He took care to ensure that the lad had a fine education and that his prodigious gifts would be well developed. But, and I can't stress this enough, Joseph was a child that George fathered with his slave, a human being that he owned. So George is still canceled. And that's the last time we're mentioning George St. George. We're barely into this story and there's already too many Georges. From now on, when we say St. George, we're referring to Joseph, his son. Joseph had been studying violin back in Guadeloupe, taking lessons from the plantation manager, and Joseph was pretty good. Uh, by age three, before most children developed their fine motor skills, he was showing signs of potential prodigiousness. Upon his arrival in Paris, St. George studied with some of the finest violin composers of the Baroque era. But one would emerge as an inspiration for Joseph, quote, whose early classical style, replete with elegance and charm, was very much in the idiom that St. George himself would adopt. And that was Francois Joseph Gossick. Now, let's stop here for a minute to acknowledge the gravity of this situation. I'd like to tell this story like any other, like it's normal, but it's not. Joseph St. George was a black man. He was not white passing, and this was the 18th century. Slavery was still legal in many parts of the world, including in France, though that would change during St. George's lifetime. Let me tell you, as a student of music history, either in high school or college, or just doing research on my own time, which is something I do, we never encounter a single person of color. Conventional music history, as evidenced by our first three episodes, is the story of white men. And as we'll find out in this story, there were, and are, many forces trying to keep it that way. Now, St. George was not just a musician, oh no, he was a champion fencer. And I'm assuming that unlike his father, he didn't do it drunk. But who am I to judge? He attended the Academy. Uh, 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 nope. He attended the Academy Royal Polytechnique des Armées de l'Equitation. What does that mean? 
Yeah, uh, basically a school for fencing and horsemanship. Why didn't they just say that? And upon graduating, he was made an officer serving as a bodyguard to the king, there acquiring the title Chevalier de Saint George. Chevalier. Love my French. While serving in the court of the king, they quickly found out about his musical ability. Bring out the violin, boys. I guess the king wasn't having many threats made against his life. Yet. King Louis was so taken that he encouraged his wife to take music lessons from St. George. And so it was that St. George became the private music tutor to the wife of the king. The queen, if you will. Queen Marie. Marie Antoinette. Now, in 1769, Gossack, St. George's music teacher, started an orchestra called the Concert des Amateurs and made Joseph its leader. Four years later, in 1773, St. George would take over as its director. Now, St. George's star was already on the ascendant, but this position made him in demand. His orchestra, which, under his direction, was not only technically remarkable, but also very large, would play his violin concertos, causing them to be snapped up for publication. His body of work would amount to, quote, three sets of string quartets, two symphonies, eight symphony concertinas, six operas, three violin sonatas, 14 violin concertos, a sonata for harp and flute, a bassoon concerto, a clarinet concerto, a cello concerto, six violin duos, and a number of songs. St. George was unstoppable. Rated R starts Friday. With all this success, in 1776, he was among the nominees to head up and write the ship of the then-struggling Paris Opera. As director of the first new professional orchestra in over a century, the student of a prominent composer and private music instructor to the Queen, St. George was the natural choice for this position. However, quote, Three of the Paris opera's leading ladies presented a petition to Queen Marie Antoinette, assuring Her Majesty that their honor and delicate conscience could never allow them to submit to the orders of a mulatto. To keep all this from embarrassing the Queen, his student and friend, he withdrew his name from contention for the position. It is 3100 BC. We are in ancient Egypt, and the dashing Prince Tamino is being chased by snakes. He passes out and is awoken by Papageno, a man dressed like a bird. Papageno takes credit for killing the snakes, but it was actually the magical attendants of the Queen of the Night, who appear just then conveniently and give Tamino a portrait of the Queen's daughter, the beautiful Pamina. Tamino is immediately in love. But Pamina has been captured by the evil Sarastro and has been ordered to be chained up along with the birdman Papageno. Uh, this is the magic flute. This is Mozart's opera, the magic flute that you're telling. Hold on a second. Pamina has been ordered to be chained up along with the birdman Papageno by the conniving, vicious, and lustful Monostatos. A slave. Yeah, there's scholarly research on this subject, and that's our boy. Mozart had some pretty major beef with St. George, probably. In 1778, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was in Paris and at rock bottom. His mother had just died, he was broke, and most of all, he hated the French. He called them, quote, frightfully arrogant, and he was, quote, appalled by their general immorality, and he felt that, quote, they understand nothing about music. Mozart was sort of like a grown-up child actor at this point. He had been very successful in his youth, and while still very popular in his young adulthood, money was not really a thing for him right now due to many commissions that failed to materialize in actual cash. However, when he was touring in his youth, among the many people he impressed was Baron von Grimm. That can't be his real name. Okay. Uh, Baron von Grimm, who was definitely not a vampire, but a diplomat and a secretary to the Duke of Orléans, in 1778, upon Mozart's arrival to Paris and down on his luck, Baron von Grimm insisted on being his mentor and manager. Which apparently meant putting him up in a palace. Who does he think he is? A teacher? Oh, but this palace was full of other artists. Kind of like a hostel, I guess, but... 
palace. One of those artists, of course, was St. George. He was effectively Mozart's roommate. Hmm. Can two divorced men share an apartment without driving each other crazy? Now, St. George was everything Mozart was not at this point. John Adams, the president of the United States at the time, called him the most accomplished man in Europe. He was fresh and exciting. He was, quote, popular with the ladies, and of course, close to the queen, even regularly going ice skating with her. Oh yeah, and did I mention that they started calling him Black Mozart? White Mozart avoided St. George at all costs. His father, an established musician in his own right, told Wolfgang that he should play for St. George's orchestra, a plea which Wolfgang flatly refused. It was obvious he was more than aware of St. George's music, though. It is widely suggested that a melody from Le Petit Rayon, a ballet suite that Mozart composed with a couple other people who remain uncredited, though possibly one of them was Francois-Joseph Gossick, it is suggested that this melody, as well as the theme from Mozart's famous Ave Verum Corpus, is, well, plagiarized directly from pieces by St. George. Of course, St. George's pieces don't survive. In 1791, the French Revolution was breaking out, and St. George volunteered to fight. He, quote, threw himself wholeheartedly into the revolution's egalitarian cause, and with his background as a champion fencer, as well as a horseman, as well as the king's bodyguard, he quickly became a colonel of a regiment that bore his name, the Legion de St. George consisting of over a thousand black soldiers, Europe's first all-black regiment. He appointed as commander another man from the Caribbean who was also the son of a plantation owner and a slave, Alexander Dumas. Not the one you're thinking of, though. He wasn't the guy who wrote The Count of Monte Cristo. That was his son, who also named his son Alexander Dumas. Anyway, this Dumas would go on to become France's first black general-in-chief. The second was Toussaint L'Overture. And it all started with St. George. Their legion would prove pivotal, fending off an Austrian invasion coming in from northern France, later called the Maginot Line. World War II buffs out there know what I'm talking Stay on topic. All the while, still finding the time to build an orchestra among his ranks and give concerts every week. He was so cool. St. George's military life would come to a sudden and unjust end when he would be falsely accused of misappropriating military funds. It would not be the battlefield that nearly killed him during the French Revolution, but his own country. For this crime that by all accounts he did not commit, he would be threatened with execution. Ultimately, he would serve a year and a half in prison from which he would emerge with shattered health and an eye toward complete retirement from music. But if you've learned anything about St. George by now, he couldn't quite do that. In 1797, he was living alone in a small apartment in Paris where, despite his failing health, he would quietly rededicate himself to his first instrument, the violin. Quote, Toward the end of my life, I was particularly devoted to my violin. Never before did I play it so well. Picture it. A man alone with his violin. With a life that featured scenes of escaping bondage being in the king's royal guard, ice skating with Queen Marie Antoinette, directing what would become the largest orchestra in Europe, having a body of work eclipsing most composers of his day, both in quantity and quality, fighting for abolition in other parts of Europe, serving as an officer in the French Revolution, and being the leader of the first all-black regiment in the history of the Western world. And there he was, alone in his apartment, this was not an accident. Quote, Despite all his successes, St. George could still not escape the color of his skin. In 1794, slavery finally became illegal in France, but St. George was not allowed to marry. He had many friends, frankly, many girlfriends. Maybe even the queen was rumored. But it seemed that people only passed through the life of St. George. Famous and influential people that illuminated his music, however, None of those people remained in his life. They were kept at a distance by laws and a culture that rendered St. George a novelty, and ultimately, a footnote. 
In the spring of 1799, an untreated bladder infection left him in constant pain. Fatigue and fever had become the norm for St. George in his final days. He was taken in by a man named Nicholas Duhamel, an old friend who had served under him during the Revolution. St. George would die on June 10th, 1799, at the age of 53. But at least he did not die alone. St. George did not have a wife or kids or a family of any kind to speak of, so he left behind only his music, a lot of it. When he died, his music was widely published and still largely popular. So what happened? Well, just as famous and influential people played a role in his life, they would after it as well. On November 10th, 1799, in the interest of forming a more centralized and autocratic government, the consulate would become the highest level of French government with its first consul, its top position being occupied by, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1802, Napoleon would rescind the ban on slavery and shortly thereafter would ban St. George's music, effectively erasing him from history. St. George left a legacy that was dismantled by one man with the stroke of a pen. That's all it took. That's all it takes. It is so important to continue to speak the names of the dead, especially those who are marginalized in life, so we can remember who they were and how they shaped their pocket of history. I might not say it very well, but... Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de St. George, son of Nanon, a slave on the archipelago of Guadeloupe, lived with and around those who remain remembered while creating a lifetime of music that, like the man himself, is, with intention, mostly forgotten to time. Mostly. If you have the power of being remembered, you have the power to make people remember others. We need to cover St. George in our history classes, but that starts with remembering him, hearing his work, and saying his name. We leave you with our favorite of St. George's few surviving pieces, his quartet number three in F minor, F, of course, today's tonic. Gin and the Tonic is a production of Fly North Theatricals in residence with the Kranzberg Arts Foundation. Today's episode was written by me, with research and additional script writing by Sabrina Ortiz. Caroline Guffey is behind the camera, with technical support from John Gramlich and Lucy Myerskoff. Bradley Rolfe did the editing, ran the sound, and poured the drinks. If you've got this far, why not subscribe and ring that bell for notifications so you never miss an upload, and if you really liked it, consider becoming a patron on Patreon, just like Kel... Hadrian, Macmont, Teddy, Jody, and Katie. Thank you for everything. <laughs>